Okay, I'm Margaret Ryle, and I'm here to talk about global projects and action research. Um, I first want to thank Steve and Lucy for inviting me here and thank all of our sponsors, uh, especially IRON because I'm connected and have been connected with IRON for many years. Um, let's um, start with the first slide. So, learn, um, leading through action research, igniting the change that you value. Uh, action research is a process of getting you engaged in making change in your workplace. So, you start by thinking about what problems or challenges would you like to address? What is it that you would like to change? In the past, when you changed things, how did you know if the change that you put in place worked? What evidence can you point to that you, that, that others can know that what you did actually made a difference? What are you learning each time you lead a new global approach to, to teaching or learning? And most importantly, how do others benefit from what you are learning? And that's really what is so critically important in action research. It's externalization of your knowledge so that other people can benefit from it. So action research is a process of deep inquiry into one's own practice, aligned with values, and shared with others to move toward an envisioned future. So um, in this talk, I'm going to just quickly go over what action research is. You find, you find a problem that you care about, you plan and study, you take action, you collect and analyze data, and then you reflect on that data, share it with some critical friends that are helping you think about action research, and then plan and study again. Think about how to, how to do the next improvement on the um, solution that you proposed here. Again, take action, again, collect data, Reflect. Now you might share it with more people, share it with the local participants. You're getting better at it. You try again, you take action, you analyze the data, you reflect, and you share this time with action researchers so that you are externalizing your knowledge so that other people can take advantage of it. Now, I'm not going to be able to tell you um, how to become a, um, an action researcher in this short half-hour talk. But I will be able to tell you in a longer set of tutorials that are online and available to you at any time. So I point you in that direction if you're interested in becoming an action researcher. Um, but today what I want to do, and I think it's probably more important, is to, is to um, really deal with why you would want to become an action researcher. So. Um, I'm going to go through three types of reasons that um, are th uh, three th three uh, levels of reason why you might want to become an action research. The first has to do with it, with you as a practitioner. The second has to do with the kind of change you'll see in your um, collaborative setting, and the third is your interaction with other action researchers. So let's look at each of those. Uh, let's look at the first one. So why engage in action research? Action research changes your professional identity, your practice, and your knowledge. So on the first level, the researcher focuses inwardly um, and asks that really important question, how can, I, how can I be better at what I do? How can I improve the way I, and you can fill that in with any practice that is really important to you. Now the thing about an action researcher is that it blends two really different roles, that of an activist and that of a researcher. So who are activists? Activists are people who see problems. They make changes, they help others to solve their problems, they listen, they care, they're compassionate. A researcher wants to understand the change, to think critically, to help others understand the change, and most importantly, to generate new ideas for change. So um, many, of, many of 
many global educators and leaders have already taken on the role of being an activist, but to take on the role of a researcher is often a shift. And it's an important one, and I'm going to try and, it's one that I'm going to try and convince you that you should take on. And when you try to balance it, so we have two people doing these same roles, and this dual perspective requires changes both to the activist and to the researcher. And the way in which you balance those two roles uh, will will differ depending on where you started. If you started as an activist and you're balancing research, or if you started as a researcher and you're becoming more act, uh, taking more action in, uh, in in a range of settings. So the balance isn't set. What I want to get from this slide is that each person is going to find the balance that works for them. So let's talk a little bit about the balance in terms of paths to expertise. So I'm going to assume that all of you are working toward and, and you know, really want to develop your expertise. So the question is, what path are you going to take? If you take one that is heavily balanced toward um, research and you follow, say, research-based strategies, you view teaching and learning as a science, and your goal is to reduce the time and effort it takes to implement a lesson because you're going to practice that lesson until it is perfect. Now, the problem with that is that new ideas or practices are seen as untested and risky, so it's safer to stay with what works. Why change? Of course, what's the outcome of such an approach to working? Well, you get bored and the people that you interact with get bored because you are um, you are not adapting to the changes in the environment. And in all work, teaching and all other work, things are constantly changing. So you can't just do what you did before better. You have to be ready to change or innovate or invent or create. Now, if action is not balanced with research, the problem that you get is that teacher, teaching or leading is seen as an art. Um, you get highly creative practice implementing new tools, programs, ideas, technology, often without worrying about why it might work. The slogan is change is good. Um, you want to be on the cutting edge of innovation. And that's a good thing, right? New ideas or practices do engage students, and it's important for that to be um, uh, to be taking place, but what's the outcome of too much innovation? You get to the state of burnout, and that's not a way to sustain work. So, um, you know, without understanding why something works, trying new things all the time, the trial and error of that is really um, too costly on both the person and the people that you're working or interacting with because change all the time will cause tension rather than um, uh, expertise. So the third path, the path that I hope I can convince you is the path that you will want to take is action research. So action research balances both action and research, brings them into a kind of back and forth um, analysis so that you start with um, practices that do come from research or other people have found to be effective. But if you don't succeed the way you want to, you try, try again with the goal of creating a deeper understanding and, an, and a um, desire to maintain an optimal balance between innovation and efficiency. So you're willing to test new ideas and critically evaluate the outcomes. So you get a balance between boredom and um, uh, burnout, which, you know, is a, is, a, is a way to live life in a kind of joyful state of learning. And I know that when people think about doing research, they don't think about joy. But really, if you do your work in a way that you're constantly asking yourself, how can I be better? What if I try this innovation? What will I, how can I tell if it's working? If you constantly challenge yourself to change, but change in a way where you're 
understanding the outcomes of your change, you will, you will find that working is more joyful. So from the practitioner's um, focus, action research uh, outcomes are a self-conception of your, a self-conception of an action of a, <laughs> sorry, your self-conception changes to that of an expert learner as well as a teacher. So being able to think in terms of your role as a learner, your ability to model learning for others is an important shift in the way you see yourself and the way others see you. You will get methods and practices for learning over time that make work more joyful. And you will develop uh, both, you will produce new knowledge, but you'll also have a reason to consume knowledge. You'll have a reason to read or keep up with with what other action researchers are doing because you know that that will help you make better sense out of the things that you're doing. So let's look at the next level that I wanted to um, orient you to, towards. And that's um, why in, in our process of answering that question of why engage in action research, if you study change, you will be better able to predict how complex social systems work. And of course, that knowledge is the knowledge of leaders. It's the knowledge that will help you be more effective in your setting. If you know what's going to happen before you try something, then um, you will be better able to, to make the um, really tough decisions about which innovations to try. Um, so, this is um, a triangle from Ingstrom's activity theory. Uh, he looks at activity systems. I find it useful in thinking about um, action research. So you have, here's the action researcher, and the action researcher is going to be studying some small action in, the con in this larger context. And that's one of the hard things that action researchers really struggle with is how do I separate out the um, the problem that I'm, the, the change that I'm creating from the larger activity that I'm engaged in, because you can't study everything all at once. This action research is a way of studying the effect of small changes in a larger system over time. So here you have the action researcher and the, um, and the action research project and the action or the desired outcome. So you can see, I guess I could be uh, sort of drawing a little circle around here. So that's the action research project, but the action researcher is interacting with the community because actions are always with people. And, um, and when it is with people, it is always with technology. So finding the best tools interacting with the community, the community already has a set of roles and a set of rules that constrain their behavior. You might be trying to change those rules or you might be trying to change those roles. Um, those are all part of the outcomes that you're going to be looking for when you do action research. So um, uh, this activity system just allows you to kind of look at what are the different aspects of change that you're going to be looking for as you reflect and you analyze um, your outcomes? Uh, some people use a logic model in much the same way as that activity um, system diagram worked. So here you have your inputs. These are the things that you are doing. Uh, this is uh, well, these are the, the things that will shape what you're doing. Here's what you're actually doing, and here are the outcomes that you are looking for. These, the situation, the priorities, the assumption, and the external factors, they are the uh, context around your action. So a logic model can be a, a different way of trying to make sense of the, both the setting that you're working in and the action that you're planning to take. So when you're learning for practice, um, you, for, you have to ask, what are you changing? How are you documenting the changing, changes? 
uh, what kind of data collection and analysis will you engage in? And that means making sense of what you see, hear, and read. So um, often teachers or uh, practitioners who become action researchers are afraid that they don't have the, the really uh, long training and research skills that will um, help them make sense of what they see, hear, and read. But you, you, you can start by simple, simple interview techniques, simple surveys, simple strategies for documenting the changes that you're seeing. And then later, as you develop your skills, you can start experimenting with uh, different kinds of tools. But it's not something that you can't teach yourself and learn better over time. So um, uh, let's just look at the, again, the outcomes from at the interpersonal level, what you will learn by joint action research. You will develop the identity of someone who listens and learns from others. You will um, evolve a skillful practice of locating problems as well as solving them. Uh, leaders are people who, who can see the smoke rather than put out the flames. Uh, they know where there's a problem kind of on the kind of beginning, or they see problems where other people do, don't even see problems. So, for example, um, a teacher may be thinking that a classroom is working just fine, and a really skilled action researcher will look in that classroom and say, yeah, but this group of people is dominant, this group is dominating the uh, interactive space, and these kids over here are not engaged at all. Um, seeing that as a problem is an important part of being an expert. Uh, there are always ways of making whatever you're doing better, and seeing those leverage points for where you can increase your skills is, is part of the um, toolkit of an action researcher. So um, let's shift to the third um, uh, level at which I think, uh, or a third reason that I'm going to give you for why you should engage in action research. And that is creating and sharing knowledge can be a life-changing experience. So once, you, um, once you've engaged in this process, you have uh, held yourself accountable for actually externalizing your learning in some way, maybe you're keeping a blog or you're sharing it uh, verbally, the next really important thing to do is to record it or write it in a way that other people can learn from what you've done. So um, again, why is writing so important? Um, writing or recording, since taping is another form of saving your knowledge. Uh, one is it deepens your own knowledge. You have to organize your thoughts in order to share them with somebody else. So your thoughts may be um, all wrapped up in a nonlinear fashion in your mind. When you have to put them out in a linear fashion, it helps you understand your own thinking. It engages you in collaborative knowledge building. So when you share it with other people, they have a chance to reflect on what you did, think about how what you did contributes to their knowledge, and engage you in a conversation about that work that is very different, or engage others in a conversation about that work that is very different than if you only keep the knowledge in your own head. And then it extends your ties beyond your own personal network, if, uh, especially if you agree to speak to other groups. You start to um, uh, share, share what you know and be connected by what you know to other people. So I've been working with a small number of teachers from the International Education and Resource Network, um, uh, one of the sponsors of this um, uh, Global Leadership Week. And I just started, we've just started to put together um, their ideas on a web page. Uh, and part of it is by putting their pictures up and giving them space, I'm encouraging them to develop their ideas in a public manner. In IRN, we've been doing global projects for 28 years. We have maybe even thousands, but certainly hundreds of, teach, of student products 
things that teachers have helped students create over time, but we have almost not, no real strong, um, uh, easily accessible accounts of how you go about doing global education classrooms. We have incredible knowledge in the network of teachers that belong to IEARN, but that knowledge has not been externalized in a way that other people can take advantage of it. So I'm, um, as a, a board member of IEARN, I'm really trying to see if we can't get a number of educators to start sharing what they think with others so that we will be able to um, benefit from all of those years of experience of learning how to do global projects. Um, clearly sharing um, in conferences like this one that Global Ed has um, arranged and continues to arrange every year is another way of externalizing your knowledge. Um, the Action Research Network of the Americas is having its conference in Tennessee this year and you're all welcome to submit uh, action research projects to that conference and share. The Social Publishing Foundation is an online um, uh, web space for uh, practitioners to publish their action research as well as many journals and um, this is where um, I, I have published the work of, of my students over time so this is where you'll find examples of action research and the interact part of this um, site will take you to the action research um, uh, interact space and here is where you'll find the open and free online course on action research so if, if I've convinced you that action research is something that you would like to do here's, a, here's the space where you can find out more about it and this, these are the basic steps of um, doing action research and in each, each case there's a video activities and um, templates for those activities and resources to help you um, do those activities. So at the community level, at the scholarly level, action research um, involves an identity as a servant leader, a commitment to share what is learned with others, and a knowledge of the redesign process as ongoing. So that's basically the, um, the way that I think you can ignite the changes that you value um, with outcomes in terms of your professional action, your inquiry to social interactions, and your research community transactions that I hope you will want to engage in because I think they will lead you to a, um, a more joyful way of working. I think that when we find ourselves engaged in problem solving and problem solving where we inspire others to, um, to solve problems with us, we listen to them more wholly, we are more interested in the kinds of things they say and the beliefs that they have for outcomes. Um, so um, this is a slide with um, links to the um, uh, Cadre Pepperdine, uh, the Center for Collaborative, sorry, the Center for Collaborative Action Research, uh, and this is the interactive space. And I see that my co-editor um, on uh, in, for the center has just joined us, Catherine, Kathleen, and um, I. I know that we don't have a lot of time together, but I wondered if you have um, some questions that you would like to add. And what I will do is, while we're while we're thinking about what questions you might want to add, I'm going to slide back to. Um, oh, this really slide is gone. Um, we had a map that that um, allowed you to each indicate where you were from, but I don't see that map anymore. So, okay. Um, do you have any questions? Uh, if you want to talk them, you can push the little talk button. It's on the bottom of where my video shows, or you can type them into the um, chat box. Maybe you want to start by just um, telling us where you're from.
while you figure out where the talk box is or the chat box. Um, let me just, uh, well, first let me uh, thank Lucy, who I see has appeared, for giving me this opportunity to share something that I'm really passionate about. Uh, my own action research right now is working with practitioners. I have in the past um, worked, you know, taught action research at Pepperdine University for 13 years, and in that process, I learned quite a bit about how to support people for joint action research, but uh, moving outside of the realm of a university and people who self-select to improve themselves and try, trying to work with practitioners who are interested in, in doing action research but aren't quite clear on how to do it and they're not doing it and I have none of the regular control that a professor has, grades and timelines and schedules. It's been a real challenge, but I've enjoyed um, working on that challenge, and that's really what got me to do the tutorial, because I realized people need to learn on their own time. Um, do we have any questions? Any comments? Is anyone having trouble? Can you, you, there's a hand raised. I can help you if you want to talk. Welcome, Maria. It's, uh, we're, we're reaching the end. I know that it's probably frustrating because uh, it takes a while to uh, figure out how to connect to Blackboard. I know it took me a while to figure out as well. I missed one talk that I wanted to hear today. Um, so I'm glad to see you here, even though it's uh, at the end of the talk. And uh, if we don't have any more questions, um, we can uh, let people move on to the next talk in this um, session. I wish I could hear from at least one person. Push the talk button and say hello. Long time. Hi, my good. Ah. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know if my mic is working. I'm sorry, I didn't get you that. Could you do that again? Sister Maria, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you used action research? Uh, yes, I have been really excited and still using the action research very much. Um, with the uh, uh, Quadra 13, I have been using the eGroups Future Direction. And now I'm serving um, Spiritual Direction online for 45 um, Catholic school teacher, principal, and superintendent. And uh, and I set up a program that is like a 10-week um, session uh, for one semester here at Alameda. And uh, people have been expressing their life changing. And I want to do another action research to follow up for, the, for a different way that you can use technology for spirituality. But I need your help. Okay. Well, um, you know, I'm I'm pleased that you all turned up today, and um, I I know that they're trying to keep the, keep us on time in this conference. So I think we're going to have to end for now. But uh, keep in contact with me, and um, I'm happy to uh, you know 
provide whatever support I can for encouraging you to participate in action research or engage in action research. So thank you very much. Thank you.